Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Missouri Review Zoom space. I'm Mark McKee, Managing Editor at the Missouri Review, and I'm honored and excited to speak with Robert Stothert, the nonfiction winner of the 2020 Jeffrey E. Smith Editor's Prize for his essay, Opera House. You can find Stothert's essay in the spring 2021 issue, the print issue of which is out now, and the digital issue of which is just on the verge of being released. Stothard has generously agreed to read an excerpt from his winning essay, a wonderfully rich reflection that constructs and realizes the personal and public impact of opera, particularly the Santa Fe Opera House, the site and living center of the piece. After his reading, Stothard is going to talk with us a little bit more about how this essay came to be. Robert Stothard is retired from the Humanities Division at Northwest College in Powell, Wyoming. Before that, he taught 10 years at the Nooksack Tribes Extension Site part of the Northwest Indian College out of the Lumi Nation near Bellingham, Washington. His work has appeared in Black Warrior, New England Review, and Florida Review, among others. He won the 2018 Conger Beasley Jr. Award from New Letters. His collection, Wyoming from the Algonquin, was a finalist in the 2020 Autumn House Book Awards. And now, Robert Stothard, reading from his essay, Opera House. Thank you, Mark McKee, and thank you for helping me through this. Thanks to all of the editors at uh, the Missouri Review and the Jeffrey E. Smith Editors, Editors Prize. Um, the love and support you, you give all of the participants is, is, we're all grateful for that. The first section of my essay, Opera House, is overture. Most, most, uh, most operas begin with an overture or at least a small prelude. Similarly, my essay um, about opera takes a couple of pages to lay a foundation for themes and images that run through the entire piece. Oddly enough, this, uh, this overture speaks largely uh, about geology. This is because when my wife and I go to the opera, we leave our home at the southern end of the Bighorn Basin in Wyoming, drive through the Wind River Canyon, and out east, to the east face of the Rocky Mountains, all the way down to Santa Fe and around to the Opera House perched over the Rio Grande Valley. Our visual overture through this drive is a continuous display of colorful rock strata, shadowy faults, ancient lava flows, the immense uplift of mountain ranges and open expanses of the vast plains to the east. All of this reveals aspects of our Earth's dramatic and in its own way, operatic life. Opera House Overture. A mere 7,918 miles in diameter, Earth, our home together, travels a minuscule distance in relation to all that we see on clear nights, light years away out in the stars. The core of our globe is a mix of iron and nickel, solid like a cherry pit. That solid inner core is wrapped in a liquid outer core and around that a mantle 1800 miles thick about the distance from New York to Denver. This mantle solid in parts, liquid in places, plastic in others roils in convection currents under a relatively thin 14 mile crust, a vulnerable skin of sorts that weathers all seasons while holding on in a tenuous relationship with the globe's deeper workings. That crust beneath our feet is constantly buckling, cracking, spreading, wrinkling, and pouring forth to reveal as a face reveals what goes on inside. Earth is face all over, and its insides are hot, reaching in places 8,000 degrees Fahrenheit. In a similar way, all of us on Earth are hot under our skins. We stay around 98 degrees inside like a sultry August afternoon. Besides that, our inner emotional temperatures swing wildly. As with our globe, contained though we are, each of our faces displays what's going on and has gone on inside. Look at photographs of Abraham Lincoln through the course of the Civil War. Look at Dorothea Lange's migrant mother, 1936. No matter our cosmetic preparations or our plastic surgeries, our inner churning will mark us in one way or another and Earth is our stage. We are held in its gravitational clutches under its shifting atmospheres. 
Earth takes its toll on our inner burnings as we fashion entrances and exits through scenes strutting and fretting our hours together on this little stage in cosmic space. Certain places on Earth give dramatic views of the globe's inner life. Geysers and chromatic pools in Yellowstone's caldera, Spider Woman's perch 800 feet above the floor of Canyon de Chez, Mount Monadnock's bare metamorphic pinnacle out of New Hampshire's woods. We travel for the sublime perspective gained when we visit geological wonders, even those that take us to the brink of the cataclysmic. The Opera House works in much the same way by giving stage and voice to plays of our inner lives and the way those lives sing to each other through comedy and tragedy. Against the dark, opera stages construct islands of light for the likes of the Dutchman's ghostly ship or the Paris garret shared by a group of Bohemians. Technicians like acrobats high in the rafters have set and focused lights while timing and blending colors for a concentrated three hours through which our inner lives play out before us. In lonely arias, tender duets, contentious trios and exultant choruses, the opera house brings specimen worlds to life in harmonies and dissonances through marriages of music and words, voices and instruments, texts and scores, costumes and wigs. We buy tickets to view these skillfully constructed worlds where we witness our own faults and our eruptions, our deceptions and jealousies, our weddings, our deaths, even our journeys to the underworld. Otello, Cosi Vantuta, Carmen, Death in Venice, Orpheus and Eurydice. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, you talk a little bit about your inspiration behind this essay in both your artist statement and in your recent feature on our website discussing what it was like for you to win the prize. Could you tell us a bit more about the process of going from young person in food service who couldn't stand the opera crowd to having a lifelong love for opera itself and how that played out in writing this piece? There, 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 are, there are many ways that that happens. Actually, the, uh, the essay started, and I'm, and I'm fascinated by where pieces start. I started as a poet and I was really taken with Tom Gunn's book, The Occasions of Poetry and Richard Hugo's Triggering Town. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I'm fascinated where pieces start. This piece actually started with those two uh, exiles from Wyoming I met in the parking lot um, after um, uh, Candide. And, and I started thinking about how they came to opera and, 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 um, and the pieces started coming slowly together. Of course, um, it's Santa Fe opera uh, that John Crosby started in the late 50s, because the Santa Fe opera is a huge community effort. Um, the, the, city, the city fills in the summer for the opera. And, and when you go for the first time, you, that, 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 that enthusiasm in, is infectious. I mean, there is all, the, there's all the, the fancy dressing, but people go in jeans and in shorts, and it's, and it's very relaxed. And all of a sudden, the lights go out, there's no curtain, uh, you, you've watched the sunset over the Hamus Mountains up back behind the open stage. The lights go out and it hits you. Um, you're, you're in this uh, specimen world, as I say in, in the essay. Oh, that's just lovely. Um, I, I, too, I share your, uh, your fascination with beginnings. I always, uh, anytime I'm reading a poem, and any, anything for, for that matter, but it's especially um, pertinent to me as a poet, I always fancy that I can find, oh, well, this is where the poem started for the poet. And everything else had to be arranged around what this center, you know, what this kind of like this instigating, this triggers, you know, as Hugo, Hugo would say, um, everything kind of collects around it. And, and the author, the poet, the essayist eventually has to find the shape and the form that, that, that most, uh, that most develops around it and in, in, in the way that you want to have happen, the things that you're exploring. Um, did you, was this a long process for you? I mean, I think it, it seems as though it was kind of a, 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 a slower or kind of paced kind of like collection of the fragments of things that you recognize as being um, very important to your love of opera. I, I think that that's right. Um, 
the, the starting by meeting those two ex Wyoming guys mm -hmm. in the parking lot was immediate. I started sketching things right away. And then all I, all of a sudden I realized that all the parts were there. And it took a couple of years to assemble all of them. I, I remembered, as I, as I said, I think it's in the art, artist statement, driving with my family in the car on Saturdays, listening to the Metropolitan Opera and hearing these huge ovations and really being moved by them and when what in the hell is going on that, that, that's, that's, that's moving that, that whole audience of 3,000 people to cheer and, and hoot. Um, so I wanted to know, I wanted to get into it. And then, as I mentioned in the essay, there was a wonderful class at the University of Washington with William Dunlap, who was, who was a poet himself, who asked us to look at um, first Shakespeare, was, the, the class was called Shakespeare and Opera. So it asked us to look at passages in Shakespeare and ask us, how do we just score that? And I really started thinking about how I would score any poem of the, of the poems I was writing at that time. Where would the oboes come in? Where, where would there be rhythm sections? And then I started listening more to opera. And, and as you say, the pieces just slowly started coming together. They were much more fully collected than I would have thought if I had just sat down after that uh, um, meeting in, in the parking lot and said, I'm gonna write about a piece of an opera because I'm in no way a, an authority of opera. Well, I mean, the, the love shines through though at, in ways that I think are important um, for the kind of essay that it, that it is, that the, the, the humanity that it, that it delivers, it's very, we're, we're thankful to have it. And, now uh, we'd like to turn to what you might be working on now um, while we've got you. Can you tell us about some of the projects you're working on or if there are works that have been completed and are on the horizon of publication or just anything you'd like to plug? I, I don't have any, any pieces out currently. I mean, the, the fall season is kind of starting and with, things have been kind of slowed with COVID. I have a book that's out and around Wyoming from the Algonquin. Um, and, and that's a slow process. I haven't had a lot of time to work on that because the mm -hmm. individual pieces take, take much of my time. And I actually like individual pieces going into literary journals out and about. I like that ability to enter a conversation you know, with somebody in Missouri or somebody in, in uh, Boston or something like, like mm -hmm. that. So that's taken up much of, most of my time. I'm working on, my, the, the, the essay I'm working on is called um, the April of my Tom Jones. It's about writing a book report on Tom Jones when I was in the ninth grade that coupled, I kind of cheated by, by, by coupling it with the movie that came out in, 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 the, in the 1960s. But the framing element about that piece is one, one day in Santa Fe walking to school and having a door open out of the sun that I didn't know was there and it was my English teacher. And she called me in to zip up the back of her dress because her arthritic fingers couldn't close it. So, mm. so, the, so the piece oh, wow. is about being called into her room and I really admired this English teacher. Mm -hmm. um, then, then my first reading of Tom Jones and then finally zipping her dress up <laughs> before going <laughs> to class. Yeah, well that, I mean, that's a whole different kind of Madeleine, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it, it is. Yeah. Uh, well, Robert, thank you so much uh, for being here and for speaking with us and for, with TMR readers. Uh, and thanks so much for the TMR readers for joining us and, and, and uh, checking out this video. This year's Jeffrey E. Smith Editor's Prize, I am here to remind you, is in full swing. And you can find out more details about the contest and how to submit on our website, which we'll link to below. Uh, in the off time, I'll get any, um, any website links that, that Robert has. And we hope you have a wonderful, healthy, and safe creative night. Um, thanks again, Robert, and to everyone else, be well. Thank you, Mark, and thank all at the Missouri Review. Thank you. It's our pleasure.